welcome back. And it's a cold day here on the farm in Mukumalanga, but I hope you are nice and warm. This is session one of the Pesach 2023 Bible study. Uh, the message we have for end day endurance. I trust you have watched the first video, the, the summary and the outlining um, of the whole message, which consists of six sessions. So session number one is all about how did we get into this much trouble? Because we are studying history so that we can find prophecy and encouragement and warnings for the end days. And the history is from the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And we need to understand how did the people of God that we discussed in the first session, how did these people get into this much trouble? Because that gives you a clear indication and a very good understanding of the trouble and the mess that all of humanity is in. In session two, we'll have a look at how did we get out of this trouble? How were the people of God able to return to the covenant land? But now session one, we first have to see what caused the exile? What caused um, Yahuwah to allow Babylon to capture his people, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, to take them out into um into, into Babylon um, slavery and uh, make them subject to the Babylonian king. So we have a look at Nehemiah 1 verse 4. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and I mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So this is wonderful Nehemiah. Um, when, when he heard the, the bad news that Jerusalem has been destroyed and the walls have totally been broken down and the city has been burned, that he fasted and he cried and it was, um, it was horrible news for him. And so it must be for us because the kingdom of God, like we discussed in the previous session, is this city. The city Jerusalem represents the, the people of God. And as these people are broken down, as our faith and our obedience to the covenant lifestyle that God instructed his people to follow, as that has been broken down, like the walls of Jerusalem has been broken down, then we should also sit down, weep and pray and discuss this with God and make sure that we understand why this happened so that we also have um, our part in, in trying to rectify this. Because there's no problem in, in scripture where God doesn't give us the solution. So Nehemiah said, I beseech you, O Lord of heaven, the great and the terrible God that keeps covenant and mercy for them that love him and obey his commandments. So people say the Bible calls God a terrible God. Yeah, you know, it does. But look at the... Look at what it says about this terrible God. He has mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. So as we understand where our troubles came from, how our punishment, how the exile, how the curses on this earth and in humanity, how that has um, taken place and we understand it's a consequence of our not loving him with all our heart, not obeying all his commandments, then we can go to him in fasting and prayer, just like Nehemiah. And we can stand in for ourselves, our families, our friends, for the lost sheep of Israel, the blind sheep of Judah, and for all the Gentiles and for every human being whom God does not want to go astray. So we beseech you, Lord of heaven, just like Nehemiah, let your um, ear be attentive now and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. For what? For the children of Israel, thy servants. So being part of the rebuilding of the walls starts right here with understanding how we got into this much trouble. And then once we understand that, we can also, like Nehemiah, pray before God day and night and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both me, Nehemiah, and my father's house have sinned. Understanding that repentance 
through the blood of the sacrifice. These guys didn't understand Yeshua yet. We do. But it's still the same process. You repent before the God of heaven and earth. A sacrifice is brought. The blood is used as an atonement, a covering for those sins. And if you really repent and you stop sinning, then that is how this terrible, this great and terrible God, how he can legally have mercy for them that love him and obey his commandments and who put in the effort of praying and fasting and weeping and crying before him. We cannot stand in for each other's sins, but spending time in the, in the spiritual realm, on your knees, doing the, the service of a priestly servant, that opens the way for the God of heaven to hear and, and work in the hearts of everyone that you pray for, so that they will also have the opportunity to learn and understand that the kingdom of God is much bigger than just saying, please forgive all my sins, amen, and I've got a ticket to heaven. It's about understanding what his covenant is, understanding how you have transgressed that covenant, and then to confess those transgressions so that he can have mercy. And yeah, Nehemiah is teaching us what it means to rebuild the walls. He is he's praying for every stone of these walls that have been broken down that now has to be rebuilt. He's praying for his own sins, for his father's sins, for all the children of Israel's sins. And this is the beautiful heart of a servant bride. We all want to be the bride. We all want to claim that we are the bride of Christ. It doesn't work like that. Like that. If you really understand the, the, the progress from servant to, to bride and that and that beautiful journey that a person walks then you understand that this that Nehemiah is doing is pure bridal work but the person that does this work that stands in like this like Nehemiah does not think of him or herself as bride they think of themselves as servants before the almighty God humble servants sinful servants in need of mercy and grace. So Nehemiah continues, we have dealt very corruptly against thee. We have not kept thy commandments, nor thy statutes, nor thy judgments, which thou commanded thy servant Moses. And yes, it's understandable. We've been taught all our lives while we were in Babylon, while we were in mixed religion, while we were in confusion, because that's what Babel means, another gateway to El, a confusion about this gateway to El, Babylonian confusion. We have been taught not to give any attention to what God commanded Moses. And because of that, we have dealt corruptly with him. We have not kept his commandments. We have transgressed against him. And that is why we, we earned the exile and the judgment. So remember, session one, how did we get into this much trouble? Because we have not kept your commandments. Remember, I beseech you, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. It's a warning. God has been giving us this warning since the time of Moses. Since the earliest times, God has warned us, if you transgress against me, I will scatter you among the nations. And this is very important to understand. Remember how the ten tribes that were driven to the north of Judea and then in exile to Assyria and from Assyria into all the nations, into every tribe, nation and tongue. And the two tribes that is representing here all the um, all the tribes, the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, exiled to Babylon, came back after 70 years. But how, how Nehemiah is praying? He's not praying for Judah and Benjamin alone. Here he says, all Israel, because he knows the ten tribes are not restored with Judah. It's not a restored kingdom yet with one kingdom, one covenant land and one king that reigns over them. That is to come only when Yeshua is that 
prophesied manifestation of all those prophecies of the son of David that will rule and reign with a rod of iron on the restored kingdom, on the remnant of the seed of the woman that comes together back to the covenant that God explained to Moses and gave to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So Nehemiah, in trying to explain to the people that's reading his book, why we got into this much trouble. He takes us back to the warning that God gave. Remember, I beseech you, O Yahuwah, the word that you spoke to your servant Moses, the warning you gave, sorry, the warning you gave when you said, if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But, and here is the promise that God always gives with his warnings. If you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you cast out into the uttermost parts of the heaven, yet I will gather you from there and I'll bring you to the place that I have chosen to set my name. This is the promise. And here we can, just like Nehemiah, repeat the promise for the people that we pray for so that they can also take this journey and, and, and be part of these living stones that is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. But also, when we are in tribulation, because if you look at this, this original warning that um, Nehemiah is talking about, that God gave to Moses, this is recorded in Deuteronomy 4, verse 26 to 31. And let's quickly go to Deuteronomy to Deuteronomy 4, verse 26 to 31. Let me just show you how amazing the warning and the, and the, um, uh, the promise is and how it is specifically for the end days. Let me show you. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. You shall be left few in number among the heathen where Yahuwah shall lead you. There you will serve Babylonian gods, but, again, you see here, Nehemiah knows his word. But if from there you shall seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you do what? If you seek him with all your heart, all your soul. When you are in tribulation, yes, I know, we've been taught in church, we will be raptured before the tribulation. You know what? If you're raptured before the tribulation, good for you. I don't find that in scripture. So I'm going to keep to scripture. When I am in tribulation and all these things are come upon you, even in the latter days, in the end days, if then you turn to Yahuwah, your Elohim, and you are obedient unto his voice because he's merciful, then he will not forsake you. He will not destroy you. He will not forget the covenant he made. This is encouragement. We understand how we got into this tr much trouble. We can see how it is our own fault. But we can also see the promise God makes for us to endure all the way to the end. To endure the rebuilding of these walls of Jerusalem. We'll get to session four where we, we, we see all the adversaries and all the enemies and all the challenges that will come upon such people that are willing to rebuild the walls. But through that, through the tribulation, through the latter days, when we remember how we got into this much trouble, and we remember how we can get out of it, not be raptured out of the persecution and the tribulation, but how we get out of the trouble of being in exile, being away from our God, looking at God's kingdom, Jerusalem's walls that is in ruins. How do we get out of that so we can help build this kingdom and Yahuwah can send Yeshua to rule and reign um, as the son of David, one king over one restored nation. This is how beautiful the Bible works together. All these small little puzzle pieces, Nehemiah was able to put them together. All right, so let's continue. Um, session one. So Nehemiah says, Father, that covenant promise you made in Deuteronomy 4, I beseech you, remember it. Please don't forget it. 
And it's not that God doesn't have a good memory. He's got an excellent memory. He knows exactly every word that has ever left his mouth. None of it will return void to him. His word, Yeshua, will never return void to him. But, but praying these things, reminding God of his covenant in his own words, also helps us to be part of his restoration plan. It reminds us to remember these covenants. It gives us um, faith and encouragement and endurance as well. When we have these conversations like Nehemiah did, with tears before our God. So how did we get into all this much trouble? We can look at the scattering of Israel. And as we looked at Deuteronomy 4, we were scattered because we did not obey his commandments. Um, the kingdom of um, God is from the time of King David. In King David's time, it was a combined kingdom. But after King David, Solomon took over. And after Solomon, his son Rehoboam was in charge of the two southern tribes and Jeroboam in charge of the ten northern tribes because of this tear, this division that happened in the two houses of the nation of Israel. So Ezra 5 verse 11, And thus they returned and answered, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. We built the house that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and set up. Talking about Solomon, of course. But after that, our fathers had provoked the God of heaven um, unto wrath and gave them the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried the people away into Babylon. Now, of course, Israel was carried into um, Assyria and Judah was carried into Babylon. But here in Ezra, just like Nehemiah, Ezra also understands how we got into this trouble. He also knows the history of his people. He knows the law and the prophets, the, um, the words of Moses and the testimony of all the prophets. He knows what God's plan is for a restored kingdom. So we see when Ezra and Nehemiah prays, they don't pray for the house of Judah alone. They always include all of Israel. Just like Yeshua said, I've come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. My own brothers from the house of Judah did not recognize me. But I have even other sheep from another sheepfold, and them I must gather as well. So with his first coming, he made a way, paved in blood, through sacrifice and repentance, for the scattered people of God, called Israel, the house of Israel. You don't have to be a Jew to be part of the house of Israel. You must just hear the calling of the Good Shepherd and know that originally we were all part of his plan. We have to be grafted back into the olive tree and become his nation again and share in the covenants made with Abram, Isaac and Jacob and understand they are our fathers as well. When you are believing and obeying the God of Abraham, you are the seed of Abraham because you believe in Yeshua who is the word of God that became flesh. So here Ezra always, uh, also confirms the fact that disobedience and provoking God with Babylonian false religions is what brought us into this much trouble. Ezra 9 verse 1, Then the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites um, have not separated themselves from the people of the land, so that the holy seed mingled themselves with the peoples of this land. And when Ezra heard this thing, he rent his garments and his mantle. He plucked off the hair of his head and of his beard, and he sat down astonished. And he says, Should we again break your commandments and join in affinity with the people, the pagans, the false um, religions, and all their abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you have consumed us, so that there should not even be a remnant? What is this message about? It's about the 
return of the remnant. Remember, the return of the remnant. But if we again continue to break his commandment, there should not even be a remnant to go through tribulation, to endure all the way to the end, and to be found faithful when Yeshua returns. So Ezra and Nehemiah understands this. And here we, we see how not separating yourselves like God instructed in his law from the pagans so that you are not tested by them or deceived by them to try and worship God in the same way that they worship their gods. So you need to separate yourselves. And this is why Pesach, Passover and all the other feast days are so amazing. Because during those feast days, we separate ourselves from the people of the world and all their traditions and all their doctrines and all their religions. And we come and we obey the commandments to keep the feasts holy or set apart like Yahuwah commanded us through Moses. And that is why the the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had was so amazing. You remember in Daniel 2, um, the head of gold, the shoulders of silver, the hips of brass, the two legs of iron. And then at the bottom, there was the two feet of iron and clay with the ten toes. And the Bible specifically says that the rock from the mountain without, without any human hands have come loose. And has hit this statue that represents the false kingdom, the serpent kingdom of this world. It hit the statue at the at the feet where the ten toes were, because that's where iron and clay was mingled. And mingling of seed, mingling of genetics is also a big thing here in the end days. Not only the mingling with the pagan traditions which caused our disobedience and, and, and caused the covenant to be broken, but also the, the mingling of God's people, the pure um, original structure he made us with, how this statue, these world governments, um, starting with their roots in Babylon, you know, deep serpent kingdom traces in the modern day governments, how they also have the same idea. They want to get us to mingle the seed so that they can indeed um, take over the kingdom of God. This is a very long discussion which we have done in many other studies. But today only important to understand how did we get into this much trouble? How, How has the whole world, all of humanity, Every human being that God created to be his son and daughter, how did they get into this trouble? And only for those few who are interested to find out, can they get the solution on how to get out? So let's look at the summary of this. How did we get into this much trouble? So the first thing is, we did not keep the commandments, nor the statutes or the judgments which you commanded your servant servant Moses. We served other Babylonian gods. We provoked you, the God of heaven, unto wrath. Wrath, of course, is anger. Wrath is righteous judgment. Righteously, he warned Israel, he will send them into exile. And then when it happened, how can we blame God? When the curses that he warned Adam and Eve will happen and come over them, their children, the earth, um, and and the whole uh, the whole world that he created. How can we blame him when his warnings come to pass? We have not separated ourselves from the people of the lands. We have mixed ourselves with the people of the lands. This is how we got into the trouble that we are in. How Israel got into exile. But now in session two, we are going to look at how can we get out of this trouble? How did they get out of this trouble? So our um, verse for this whole Pesach season is Ezra 6 verse 19 to 22. And the children of the captivity, aren't we the children of captivity? They have kept the Passover upon the 14th month, uh, on the 14th day of the first month. 
We learn about the calendar of God. We learn about Passover only when we come out of captivity and start obeying um, God's holy days and not the world's holy holidays. And then the children of Israel, which have come again out of captivity, and all such, look at that, all such that have separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land. All the people, no matter who you are, from which tribe, nation, tongue, country, continent, from which four corners of the earth, it does not matter. When you separate yourselves from the Babylonian filth that is prevalent in the heathen nations, of which is every nation of the world today, all of them has Babylonian um, religion mixed into their culture. When we separate ourselves spiritually, and for a short time during the feast days, we separate ourselves physically from them, then we, we seek the Lord our God of Israel, and we eat the Passover meal. And we keep the feast of unleavened bread for seven days with joy, because why? It is our God that makes us joyful. How did we get into all this trouble? Was it even necessary? If we had only kept the Passover, if we had only understood for all these thousands of years, since the first man smeared the blood onto the lintels in Egypt to make sure that the angel of death passes them over, if only we could understand that obedience to those commandments of our God, to understand the blood of that Passover lamb, we would never have gotten into this trouble. If only Adam and Eve understood that to listen to the serpent means to obey him, and to obey him means you love him, because you listened to him more than you did Yahuwah, you obeyed him more than you did Yahuwah, and therefore Yahuwah calls that whoredom. You are whoring with the serpent kingdom. When you disregard any of his commandments and you mix yourself with a popular religion, even if it seems right, it doesn't matter. If there's anything in that religion against the commandments of God, you are listening to the serpent. That's how humanity got into the trouble that we are in. But now in session two, we're going to enjoy to find out how it was that Judah and Benjamin got out of all that trouble. Because that is a pathway, that is an example, and that is instructions of how we get out of the trouble as well. I'll see you at session number two.